All right, so not a problem. I'm not going to use any presentation right now in the first session. I'm just going to be talking about aspects that you could look at in terms of what is it that design thinking holds for you. And for the entire week, don't worry, there's so much of PowerPoint presentation that I'll give you that you'll be surprised. Here's what we will be doing. And I think here's what is the basic content that you would want. And why am I not wanting to do this first session with any PowerPoint presentation? Because I want to really gear up your thought processes in terms of what's coming next. Let's understand the whole concept of design thinking. Design thinking typically is the way industrial designers think. Now, I remember my tenureship after I finished my mechanical engineering, I joined the CAD CAM company. And when I joined the CAD CAM company, I was dealing with a lot of industrial designers. And uh, they typically uh, used to interview a lot of uh, customers and then they would create a clay model. And with that clay model, they would test out whether people really were liking the product or not liking the product. Industrial designers go through a systematic way of doing innovation, of doing prototypes, doing products. This whole idea of how industrial designers think was brought in so that people could actually start emulating the process of design thinkers and start innovating themselves. And that's what design thinking is all about. Now, design thinking has two components to it. I'm talking about fundamentals right now for the next one hour so that the next five days become absolutely easy for you. And if you have any questions, feel free to put them on the chat. I'll be very happy to take the questions on the fly. We could also take the questions end of the session for sure. All right. Now design and thinking, these are the two key words when we talk about design thinking. When we talk about design, we're actually talking about a process by which we are meticulously able to prototype a product or a service or solve any complex human centric issue. Now remember as design thinkers, the key word here is complex human centric issues, complex human centric problems. Let me give you an example. And by the way, like I said in my inaugural address, there is a research that was published a couple of days ago and it said that what does the world need today? The world needs people who can solve complex problems, who are good in design thinking and who are good in critical thinking. Now, design thinking and critical thinking are two great, uh, you know, competencies that can actually create best of the engineers for sure. Now, <clears throat> let's talk about what is it that design and thinking talks about. Every time I've spoken about design thinking, I've always given this story. And this is a true story, which every design thinker would talk about. There was this subsidized kitchen that was started in Europe, in a country in Europe. And uh, the subsidized kitchen was for the elderly. Now, obviously it was for a great cause. And when they came up with this kitchen, and they offered best of the menu, best of the quality food. They suddenly realized that this food was not being consumed by the targeted clients. This became a problem. They contacted certain management consultants and they came back with a whole lot of suggestions. Change the menu, make a good menu card, you know, all that, all that. <coughs> but then what happened was, Things didn't work. And therefore came the understanding that this seems to be a complex human centric problem. Now let's understand what is the complexity here. The complexity here is that. Refresh for Refresh for All right. Can we have the gentleman muting the phone, please? Thank you. So what happened was they realized that this does not seem to be a problem that's easily solvable because they tried all the experiments. They also realized that the symptoms that were being shown, which was typically that the targeted elderly senior citizens 
were not consuming food were just a symptom. Probably the problem was something else. And this is the power of design thinking. Whether it's engineers, whether it is management graduates, what are you doing? Now, engineers typically, today, if you look at India, engineers are coming up to some fascinating products. And they want to use these products. They want to get these products out into the market, improve the quality of life of people, and ensure that they become great entrepreneurs, maybe create unicorn companies. Now, let's understand what happened in this story. What happened in this story was that the understanding of the problem itself was incorrect. They thought that there's something wrong with the food. There's something wrong with the menu because of which it is not being consumed. Then they brought in design thinkers because obviously the solution did not happen. And I think one of the key learnings here that all of us can take is design thinkers are brought in when everything else fails. That means when all the other innovation practices have failed, that's when design thinkers are brought in. And I will talk about certain real life case studies uh, before we end the session here. Now, when the design thinkers came in, what did they do? They did not look at the root cause analysis per se. They did that later. But what did they do? They went and they spoke to the senior citizens. And they tried to find out why is it that they are not consuming the food which was meant for them. And when they interviewed a great number of samples, now, obviously, in design thinking, the first step is empathize. And in empathize, what we tend to do is we go talk to the consumers of the product or the service. And we get real-time data, which is uh, data in integrity and truthful data. When they got the data, they realized that the key problem was that they all felt it was below their dignity to eat the food which was highly subsidized. Now, can you believe this? It was not about the kitchen. It was not about the quality of food. It was not about the price. It was about the dignity of a person being hurt because they're giving subsidized food. <coughs> this was a complex problem because when you're dealing with the dignity of a human being and when you're trying to arrive at a solution, it definitely is a complex problem. And therefore, what happened? The design thinkers took this up as a problem definition. And they said that the problem is that the food, the way it is being provided, is hurting the dignity of people. When they took this up as a problem statement, they realized that there was a lot more to be done. And therefore, the next step of design thinking is that all design thinkers convert a problem statement into an opportunity statement. Now, when we typically teach problem solving to engineering students or management students, we talk about problems and we talk about solving that problem. Whereas in design thinking, we convert the problem into an opportunity statement. That means we are looking at that particular problem as an opportunity and our brain starts operating in a very different way. I will take you through the neuroscience of design thinking as we move through the week. But I would definitely want to tell you in the first session here that when the brain starts working with a sense of purpose and it starts working on an opportunity, all the four lobes start firing. Whereas when we are problem solving and when we are looking at something as a task, what happens is not all the lobes fire. In fact, the rear part of the brain starts firing, which is more of the animal brain. It's more of the survival brain. And they're not operating at the peak. That means the neurons are not firing full time. <coughs> so why does creativity get enhanced when we talk about design thinking? Because now the brain is focused on opportunity. Now, what did they do next? They went back to the consumer. And again, they involved the consumer in sourcing ideas as to what is it that they wish 
so that the food can be consumed by them. Now, this is an interesting facet of design thinking. In fact, I mentioned that in your uh, colleges, if you're running startups, the biggest mistake, and I learned that at Wharton, the biggest mistake that an entrepreneur makes is an innovator or an entrepreneur believes that his or her idea is the best idea and the market will consume it. <clears throat> and that is why most of the startups fail. Startups don't fail because they were technically correct or incorrect. Startups fail because the idea that they brought into the market, the market was not willing to consume them. Now, what happens in design thinking and in this story, the design thinkers went and spoke to the consumers. They took idea from the consumers. Hundreds of ideas are generated in possibly a few hours. I remember as an engineer uh, and a management graduate, I was hearing. Uh, can we have the mic muted, please? Thank you. Okay. Ah, okay. Thank you. So, yeah, this is the hazard of all the online sessions that we go through, but not to worry, we will bring in that process. So, I was working with a Swiss company, which is into high precision uh, products that they manufacture. And we were working on a complex design thinking problem with the engineers on line balancing. And we actually went and we interviewed the workmen who were there on the machines and we took ideas from them. Were there? And, and when we took ideas from them, we could actually start moving into the next stage, which is of prototyping. So <clears throat> coming back to the story, the design thinking professionals went met up with people who were consumers of the food, took a lot of ideas, and then they came back with these ideas, and then they create what happened is the next stage, which is prototyping. And the prototyping part is the most intricate part of design thinking. Now, this is this may be a of a process. This may be a prototype of a product. This may be a prototype of a problem Sir, that you're looking Can we? <laughs> yeah, all right. So, okay, let me, let me check if I can control that. All right, I think we managed it. So what happened was that they built a prototype with the ideas that came in. And by the way, in design thinking, you might want to write this down. Uh, thank you for the principle East. Empathize, analyze, solve, and test. Well, you need to go beyond it in this session here. It will be empathize. It will be define. Then it will also move into ideation. Then it will move into prototyping and then it will move into test and scale. So we will talk about these steps as we move through. Now, prototypes in design thinking, typically uh, there is a rule that applies in prototyping, which is called fail early, fail cheap. In fact, you're preponing failures in design thinking. Now, what do you mean by fail early, fail cheap? When you create a prototype, in design thinking, you pick up the low hanging fruits. That's the next principle of design thinking. You pick up the low hanging fruits. And when we pick up the low hanging fruits, what do we do? <clears throat> All the ideas that the consumer gets, we pick up the instant ideas which can be executed immediately. Now, when that happens, that's when the prototype also starts giving you indicators whether it's going to succeed or it's not going to succeed. But the best part about the prototype is you already have everything with you by which you can implement the prototype with speed. Now, in the story that I'm giving you, what did they do? The first idea they implemented was they stopped calling it a kitchen. They started calling it a restaurant. They stopped calling the delivery boys 
as delivery boys. They started calling them stewards. They gave them a branded, nice looking uh, decor uh, and the costumes. They also went and they refurbished the way the menu looked like. They did not call the person in the kitchen a cook. They called him the grand chef. And when this started happening, what happened to the consumers of the food was that they realized that they're no longer dealing with any subsidized entity, but they're actually dealing with somebody who's respecting them for the way they are. And by the way, they also went ahead and they said that we are opening up this food to everybody. And when that happened, then the dignity factor was also taken care of. So this prototype, which was then built, was then taken out and tested in a small sample size. A lot of you here are PhDs and you will recognize the fact that sample size in the initial stage of prototyping, it would make sense to operate in a limited space with a limited sample and test out how it works. So there's a very interesting concept called the learning launch in design thinking. And in the learning launch, what you tend to do is you tend to take the prototype out. You tend to put it out there for people whose problem you're solving, whether it's an engineering solution, maybe it could be a solution which is to do with civil works. You know, typically if you look at the apartments that come up, uh, they always have one apartment, which is a show apartment where they call in people and they show that apartment and they're taking a lot of feedback in terms of what's happening. But unfortunately, how engineers operate is that the moment there is a layout of a building and if there is an apartment, now they try and oversell that apartment even if people who want to buy the apartment don't like the apartment. <clears throat> Whereas in design thinking, what we say is and that the next part of the design thinking, it's a non-linear process. And when we say it's a non-linear process, what's happening is you empathize, you define, your ideation, your prototyping, your test and scale, they are toggling between each other constantly. And because they're toggling between each other constantly, the prototype is amazingly continually going through a lot of changes. And that's the whole idea of design thinking. In fact, engineering a lot of times gives us a fixated point of view a lot of times, not always, a fixated point of view, that once you've come up with this product and this is the way the product has been designed, the features are in place, the mechanics are in place, now you don't change it, you somehow manage to sell it. And I work a lot with automotive companies and automotive companies are now going the design thinking way. Now, what is the entire failure in automotive companies? They come up with a product and they try and impose the product on the market and the market doesn't accept the product and therefore, the company's entire R&D investment over a period of time can actually go into an absolute spin. Now, that is what design thinking controls. What design thinking does for engineers is that while I was talking about this story, based on the information that the engineers get, either from the market or for, from maybe people who are internal to the system, or maybe a bunch of technical experts, they build that up into a prototype and it's no longer their own idea. It is an idea that everybody has collectively brought in. And it also caters to the idea of crowdsourcing that we talk so much on the internet. In fact, a lot of design thinking companies and I own three companies which are completely into design thinking. And I also give you a story of a technical story of an edutech company that I created on how it became a 2,500 crore company within 45 days of its creation. But coming back to the story, and I'll tell you why I'm giving this story, because storytelling is an important tool in design thinking. Now, if you look at this story, they created this entire concept, a brand, and then they took it out into the market. And suddenly, the consumption of the food went up tremendously. Which means that in design thinking, when we involve people in the process of creating a prototype and when we go out into the market to test it, normally the design thinking process becomes extremely successful. The prototypes mostly become successful. 
Now, here's what I tend to do whenever I'm working with automotive companies or engineering companies. I use the statistical score of the net promoter score or the NPS. And with the NPS, which certain success drivers of the prototype calibrated, we go out and we test for the score. And unless and until the probability is 85% plus, we don't get the prototype out into the sample space ever because we know that the sample space is going to reject the prototype. Therefore, until and unless the acceptance or the proof of concept of the prototype, the probability is 85%, we don't bring the pre-production prototype or the post-production prototype or the beta version of the prototype, whichever you may choose to call, out into the market for testing. Once in design thinking, you've tested your prototype rigorously and you're confident that the acceptance level of the stakeholders is high, that's when you start scaling the prototype either across the country or globally. This is the way design thinking operates. Now, storytelling, uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Kriv. Thank you. And you know, this is the whole idea of design thinking. Storytelling is a most important tool at storytelling. What did storytelling do to us? It allowed our brain to operate at a higher frequency. Unfortunately, we don't tell stories. We tell problems. We tell technical problems. And I think one of the way in which design thinking is taught is through stories. If you're not a storyteller, you can't teach design thinking. This is the way that design thinking problem was solved. Now, I came to the first tool called the storytelling tool. Let's understand the whole idea of storytelling tool. The process of empathizing with the market or the stakeholders is called the empathy mapping process. Now, let's say your students want to create a particular maybe machine or a design or whatever. Or maybe they're doing an engineering project, which is a final year project. And for all you know, it could be maybe sponsored by the government. They could actually pick up a complex social problem that they want to deal with. And they are now applying an engineering solution to it. Now, how would they work on this? Now, I'm trying to build a story, which is a hypothetical story now. And possibly this is what you could do with your students also. Please ask your students to go out and interview the people who are, whose quality of life is going to be impacted because of whatever solution that they want to bring out into the market. And by the way, engineers are supposed to design solutions, technical solutions, whether you are an engineer which is who's a mechanical engineer or a civil engineer, or maybe into computer sciences or mechatronics. I think mechatronics is big and mechatronics is going to be one big space in which design thinking is going to be used because design thinking, I mean, the way we do design thinking, because mostly my ticket size is of any, my, okay, let me just check. All right. Yeah. So if you look at any business problems that we tend to solve in design thinking, which could also be engineering problems that we're trying to solve. The stakes are so high that normally for these consulting projects, the ticket size is also very big. And, and since it's an open session, I don't really want to talk about the charges that consultant would get into when they're getting into design thinking solutions. But I'll tell you, it's steep. Design thinking is a very expensive way in which solutions are worked out because what happens is a design thinker gets loaded on a particular project for a period of two months or three months. Now imagine... If that were to happen, then obviously the project also tend to get expensive. So storytelling, if you were to look at it. So what happens is your students will go out, maybe discuss the project with the industry. Now, how does it help your institution? It helps your institution because what's now happening is the student is already aligning with the industry. He's already talking about a project. And all you know, maybe that particular organization with whom they're interviewing may just like them and may even get tend to give them an offer. And have I seen that happen in certain B schools when I'm running this curriculum? I have. 
In fact, I always tell students to take up a design thinking project in the area of their interest. For instance, in beach schools nowadays, fintech is big. People want to work with fintechs and the financial uh, technology driven financial companies. If they were to study that and if they were to work on a complex problem and go with the solution in an interview, can you imagine they're going to be hired for sure? And that's the way design thinking works. So let's say they go to the industry. They were to pick up certain uh, uh, problem areas. They were, uh, they were to understand what is it that the industry is facing in terms of the complex issues. And then they come back to the college. Now you are academicians who know what design thinking is all about. And now you're running the project the design thinking way. Now, whether it's a final year project or it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a problem that you're solving for the industry with your experience and with the energy of the students who are rookies in the process, you can actually come together and run this entire process and offer a real-time solution to the industry. Now, this is a gratification even for students because a lot of times students don't know why they're learning what they're learning. And design thinking can actually bring a larger perspective to what engineers tend to do. Let me share with you as to how design thinking in my real organization, I implemented design thinking. What, what, what brought me to the realm of design thinking? Now, I'm a researcher. And since I'm a researcher, what happens is I tend to study a lot because people tend to engage me for my cerebral activity and i mostly work with fortune 500 companies the reason i work with fortune 500 companies is because the problems are very complex there i'm 56 now i'm a university ranker and i felt that it makes sense that if i were to combine my corporate experience and my university um, knowledge that i acquired i'm so thankful to all the teachers who happened to me I felt that I could go out into the market and offer design thinking as a project. But for offering design thinking, I had to go through 25 international certifications before I could equip myself commercially to become a design thinking consultant into the market. So diversity of experience is the next key factor in design thinking. Diversity of experience is something that you should offer to your students. It's something that even you as academicians should get into because design thinking is looking at, and please take a note of this, design thinking, engineering, psychology, culture, management, systems thinking, statistics, innovation, behaviors. It is a design thinking is a, is, is, is a methodology which is completely completely webbed in terms of different things that a human being could do. And that is the diversity of experience required. And lastly, of course, real-time situations where you participate in problem solving, whether it is design thinking or any other. I'll give you another story before I end so you will know what exactly you're going to look at in the next five days. Now, how did we implement design thinking in our organization? I was doing my certification in entrepreneurship at Wharton. And one of the things at Wharton was that we had to create an organization before we could get the certification. Now, I'll understand this complex problem that I was dealing with. I had a company called Atyasa Global Alliances LLP, which was operating in Germany and it was operating in Bangladesh. Unfortunately, it was a situation where the European market went into recession and we had some issues in Bangladesh because of which my people were not willing to be in Bangladesh anymore. I love the country, by the way. It's a fascinating country to work. I had my own home in Dhaka and given a choice, I would love to go back again. We had a problem and the complex problem we had was that there was a company which was no longer functional. I had two choices, either to shut down the company or to rejuvenate the company. Now, I was a design thinking guy by then, and I was doing an entrepreneurship certification. It's like you could visualize there's a student in your college who's going through the utter innovation or maybe getting into some kind of a startup uh, in the organization in, in your college and incubating a startup there, or maybe you're running an accelerator there. 
I looked at my company and I said, okay, my complex problem is there's no business that I can do in this company anymore. But I didn't want to close the company. So as a design thinking person, what did I do? I went out into the market and I spoke to my clients. What is it that you're looking for? And they said, we're looking for, and by the way, I'm giving you the story because you're academicians and you will connect with the story. They said, we are looking said for digital learning processes. And when they said we are looking for digital learning processes, I said, why are you looking at digital learning processes? And then they said, training in corporate is so expensive, we have to fly down people from different areas. Plus, faculties are not available. Uh, can we have the mic switched off, please? Uh, let me just check. All right. um, yeah, done. So, I interviewed them, and then they told me that they wanted to bring in, um, they wanted a mechanism by which learning can go on the cloud. I came back to my office. I also asked them different interviews as to what is it that they would want to do. And uh, one sec, I got a message here. Sir. Kindly share speakers, mobile number and email address would be great to them. I shall do that. I shall do that. Don't worry before I wind up, I'll give you my details and you can connect with me. So I went back and uh, I interviewed them and they said digital content plus certain titles they gave me. And then I came back to my office and over 22 years, we had created a whole lot of digital content. I sat with my team and I said, all right, what can we do with this content now? So we had 100 plus blogs, we had 100 plus videos. They were our IPs. Uh, I had more than 200 podcasts. I had case studies. I had publications, around 400 publications I had. Uh, what about IPR? I, I shall certainly discuss that. I shall certainly discuss that. Now, we had the IP issue in this also. So thank you for this question. So we sat down with our teams and we said, all right, if we were to bring this entire content out into the market, will we lose our intellectual property? And then we thought, let's look at how, how is it that design thinking can work. So I started looking out for a portal where I could host this entire content without anybody downloading it, without anybody misusing it. And were we able to do that? Absolutely. So we protected our IP based on that. Now, IP can be protected, obviously, all of you know, through either patenting or trademarking, whichever way you want to go. And design thinking also, you must ensure that before you get into design thinking, uh, we can actually start prototyping the concept, we patent the concept, and then we can go, and then finally, we can also patent the end solution. Now, with that happening, we came back to the organization in our office, we sat down, so empathize process was over. We ideated along with the customer in terms of what titles they would want. We ideated within our organization also. And then we prototyped 10 titles of e-learning, 40 hours each, 4-0. We took it out into the market. We gave it to our clients for testing. And then we took a score. And we realized that the score that we got was in excess of 9.5 on 10. And when we saw that the score was in excess of 9.5 to 10, we scaled it up completely. Today, the e-learning portal of mine has 40 programs, 4-0 programs, audio, complete, complex e-learning programs. And we're now giving it away on subscription. We're giving it away even as a part of our learning process. This created a unicorn organization in 45 days. Now, this is the power of design thinking. Now, how did I use technology? So people who are into uh, computer sciences may love this. Only content was not the key. We had to choose the technology. And that's why I'm so glad that v has brought in the entire concept of technology also into uh, and information technology into uh, design thinking. We had to scout out for a whole lot of different technologies which could integrate all our content and also ensure that there's a defense grade protection and no violation of personal uh, identity of people. We integrated all that together. 
And with that integration, a portal called Atyasa Online came into being and we started moving that portal. And you know what happened? This entire tech solution that we came out with in the market, today we are the only consulting company in the world that has created an exclusive e-learning portal which is dedicated to corporate management. I'm, I was also a mentor on Coursera. I knew how it worked, so I had the diversity of experience. These are the two stories I've given you. One story that's an abstract story, we don't know what it is. One story that comes from a real-time design thinker who tells you, and you know what, during COVID, during the pandemic, we were so geared up in terms of our e-learning portal that we just did not have any problem in terms of ensuring that our clients kept the learning process on. In fact, a lot of colleges also came back to us and said, can we use it? And we were happy to offer it to them. I'm not trying to sell my product to you. Please don't misunderstand me. I'm just trying to tell you that this works. Diversity of experience. I want to give you a story on that. And I think by then you would have learned your first tool. I've already given you two stories. And by the third one, you would have learned your tool of storytelling and design thinking. And we'll talk about different tools as we move through the week. Ajay and Vijay, this is the most important story that I want to give you and then I'll start taking up the questions. Ajay and Vijay, two engineering graduates passing out of a college, employed by a corporate organization. Ajay decides to build a career which is into various aspects of business. So Ajay was a mechanical engineer, joined the shop floor, became a shift engineer, became a shop floor manager, uh, moved into the facets of business, got into marketing, got into research and development, got into human resources, got into planning, got into Kaizen, got into total quality management, uh, took up uh, international assignments, had an exposure which was a cross-cultural exposure. Vijay, on the other hand, mechanical engineer, joined the plant, decided to build a career only on the shop floor, became an absolute specialist, knew every machine, knew everything that could happen on the shop floor, was fantastic in terms of the operations. As they grew, and Ajay and Vijay, both batchmates across the age of 35 and now the organization was looking at them picking up senior management positions and that too for turning around an organization. What they realized was Ajay had diversity of experience whereas Vijay was a specialist in one particular space. I don't have a problem with specialists, please don't take me wrong. It's perfectly okay to build up a career as a specialist, be an absolute technical person, not a problem at all. But Ajay became a design thinker. And why did Ajay become a design thinker? Because Ajay had complete diversity of experience that he went through. And whenever we teach design thinking, we always tell people, please have immense diversity of experience. Now, you as faculties, you as academicians, you will have to interact a lot with the industries. You will have to solve a lot of real-time problems with the industries if you want to take design thinking ahead. How does your institution benefit? Your institution benefits because all institutions I know also as an academician, because I teach in colleges also, I know as an academician that colleges have a challenge in terms of engaging with the industry. And I think design thinking is one of the tools by which you can engage with the industry absolutely seamlessly with your students, with the academic uh, staff that you have, even with the non-teaching staff. You know, they can also be a part of design thinking process and they can also give you a lot of ideas. So Ajay and Vijay, what you are doing is you are creating Ajays through design thinking. You may also create Vijays who will operate as Ajays when it comes to design thinking. And I think with that intention, with that nobility of intention, as 
the nation builders that you are, you must spend the next one week in the process of design thinking. Therefore, design thinking uses various tools. And I'm sure there will be some fascinating faculties who will come and talk to you about different nuances of design thinking. But if I were to name a few of the tools which we use extensively in our own consulting assignments on design thinking, we use storytelling extensively. We use root cause analysis, the Ichikawa, the fishbone extensively. We use mind maps extensively. We use the process of rapid prototyping extensively. We use uh, low fidelity and high fidelity prototypes extensively. We also tend to do a lot of times A-B testing. We also tend to do uh, net promoter score as a tool. Uh, we also use tools which are storytelling, like I was saying uh, already. We also tend to use tools which could be, you know, tools like post-it bags. Because one of the things about uh, design thinking is end of every project, we create something called the museum. And the museum tracks the entire design thinking process so that when we close the project, we know what we have done. And in fact, most of the design thinking centers that we're creating in, the, in, in India actually have a museum. So these are the steps of design thinking. Empathize, going out, talking to the stakeholders, understanding their problems. That is empathize. After we empathize, and by the way, we do grueling interviews. I think a lot of times I run war rooms on design thinking. And during COVID times, we ran a lot of war rooms on design thinking because a lot of organizations had to revamp their product lines. We picked up the best of the 25 people in the organization. And 24 by 7, they didn't sleep, I didn't sleep. Hundreds of interviews were conducted in the empathizing process. Uh, does design thinking need prerequisites for students? I'll certainly come to that. I'm going to answer all the questions. And by the way, uh, we are now coming to a point where uh, we're going to have the last 15 minutes and you can post all the questions that you have and I'll be uh, discussing those questions for sure. So in Empathize, we conducted hundreds of interviews and the idea of conducting those interviews, and by the way, we used a tool called Appreciative Inquiry on which I'm certified again, but that's a complex tool. Uh, we leave it aside for a while. In the empathy process, we had all the data that we needed to understand the problem. Then we sat down. That means the next step of design thinking is the problem definition. You sit down and you define the problem. How do you define the problem? Maybe you do a root cause analysis with the Ichikawa uh, diagram. And I love the Ichikawa fishbone analysis because that gives you a complete perspective of what the problem looks like. So whatever information came in from empathy, you plot it on the fishbone. And once you plot it on the fishbone, you got a big perspective in terms of how the problem looks like. And then you come up with a problem definition, a very specific, very precise problem definition, which has measurables built into it and it's tangible. After that, we convert that into a business opportunity statement. Can we solve every problem using design thinking? I shall certainly give you a very exciting answer on that. Don't worry. So, opportunity statement. After that comes the next step, which is ideation. That means problem definition has two steps. One, you bring in all the symptoms in, put them on a tool. And then you convert that into an opportunity statement. So you get the problem definition and you get the opportunity statement, which is step two. Step three, ideation. Go out into the market. Also deal with all the technical specialists, the Vijayas in the organization. That's where they become very important. Bring all the specialists together and then the ideation process happens. This could be brainstorming. This could be post-its. There are various methods in which ideation can be done. Hundreds of ideas get created, which are called the idea banks. Out of those hundreds of ideas, you now shortlist ideas, which can be implemented as low hanging fruits. That means all design thinking solutions have to be inexpensive because research says all expensive innovations tend to not get implemented because a lot of times organizations get into cash flow issues and by then it's too late to bring an innovation in. I'm doing my PhD in the realm of VUCA, volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous world. 
We're living in absolute volatile times, turbulent times. Here, innovations and the product life cycle or the service life cycle is going to be extremely short. Oh. That means the way innovations will have to be done, they'll have to be done very fast. That's why the concept of business innovation we will touch upon as we go through the week. Once the ideation is done, then you filter it into a prototype with low hanging fruits. Once you've created a prototype, then you take the prototype out, you present the prototype, and then you start testing the prototype. Uh, you can use any statistical mechanism to test it. Uh, you can use uh, lagging indicators and leading indicators. So leading indicators are typically giving you ideas in terms of whether the prototype's acceptance level is high. And the lagging indicator is when the prototype actually gets action, how is it delivering real time out in the area where you brought it. Once the testing is done, then comes the final step of scale. And technology is used extensively in scale. And therefore, engineers are the ones who are required to scale any design thinking prototype because not only technology, but implementation of the project becomes a very key area. And in engineering, we learn so much of analysis, we learn so much of problem solving that we have absolute control on the implementation process. Master this entire process of design thinking over the next five days. Design thinking is infinite. It's been eight years and I can't say that I have mastered design thinking. I'm still a student of design thinking. But I think after doing 40 prototypes worldwide, which was solving real time business issues, I think design thinking makes you a very mature person. Design thinking stimulates you intellectually. Design thinking allows you to bring in whatever you've learned as an academician into the real world. And that's the power of design thinking. I'm going to take questions. And let me take the first question here. Uh, what about the IPR? Idea used <laughs> <to> <laughs> <problem>. <laughs> Professor Viresh, would you please mute yourself? Thank you so much. So what about the IP? Idea used for problem solving. Please go ahead. Okay, I'm muted. So please go ahead. And if you think that your design thinking concept is going to be monetizable and the monetization of your design thinking is going to be uh, very important for you, definitely makes sense to patent it. Any award for idea taken from a particular gentleman? Yeah. Well, you can go to my websites and there are uh, certificates that the clients have given in terms of how it has benefited their organizations. In fact, they've become, uh, you know, rich with this whole idea of design thinking for sure. Thank you for your question. Uh, Dr. Ramesh's question, is it available in the program schedule? It was shared in the WhatsApp. Thing. Okay, so that's a different thing. Uh, Dr. K. Satyanarayanan, can we solve every problem using design thinking? Absolutely, sir. In fact, a lot of times design thinking people who go through design thinking process say that they have also implemented design thinking in their personal lives. Design thinking okay. becomes a way of life. Design thinking becomes a way of life because once you become a design thinker, you can actually start solving a lot of complex problems even at home. Maybe it's renovation at home. Maybe it's a complex travel that you're getting into. It could be anything. In fact, interestingly, uh, while I was doing my master's program in the university, and as a design thinker, there were certain... Just hold on, huh, please. Okay. So while I was doing my master's in international business, there were certain subjects that were difficult for me. And as a design thinker, I prototyped my learning strategies for those subjects. And I'm very happy to say, finance was a very difficult subject for me as an engineer. But I, now I have a university record of 100 on 100 in finance, typically because I used design thinking in my personal life as a student to really cater to uh, the solutions uh, when it came to academics also. So you can actually design your curriculums also based on uh, design thinking. Can we have the access to video links because we have to take classes? 
you can certainly have access to all my video links when you're taking your classes. So don't worry at all. Shashi ji, uh, I am there and uh, I keep churning out a lot of content and a lot of uh, information on design thinking. It's all available. Uh, if you're there on LinkedIn, please connect with me on LinkedIn right away because there is a massive showcase of design thinking case studies on LinkedIn. Uh, you can reach me at Niket Karazgi on LinkedIn. And today in the first session itself, I'm opening up the first part of the content for you so that you think and you feel that it is time well spent. You will have, I think, I'm not very sure, but I think I already have around 20 case studies and I keep publishing a case study every week. Uh, it pertains to different areas of our design thinking work. And can you have video links? Just hold on. As you move through during the week, I will also open up a lot more content for you as we move. Uh, this is Dr. Swami Narayan. Does design thinking require critical or creative thinking? If critical thinking, then is design thinking a structured logical process? Absolutely, design thinking is a structured process. Empathize. Define, ideate, prototype, test, scale. But as you move through the process, you'll realize design thinking uses creative imagination, abstractness, as well as logic thinking. And therefore, it brings in both together. And that makes it very powerful because you're dealing with abstract and you're also dealing with tangible. And I think that's where abstract and engineering wed well. And that's where design thinking actually starts working phenomenally well. So yes, Dr. Swami Narayan, does design thinking require critical and creative thinking? It's a part and parcel of the process. You don't have to really learn that separately. If critical thinking then is a design thinking, a structured, well, I have a program that I designed on critical thinking. I actually teach critical thinking also. But critical thinking is more on terms of the logical realm. Uh, innovation is more on the abstract or the right brain. Critical thinking is more of left brain. In fact, I'm the only one who's written about cybernetic paradigm. And there's also a video on cybernetic paradigm which may interest you. In that, I, I say that when you're doing critical thinking, you tap into the repository of your knowledge and your behaviors. And if that's limited, then the way you would approach a problem also tends to get limited. And therefore, design thinking, since it uses collective crowdsourcing of ideas, also the process that is used is so open in its own way that it allows you to bring in a lot of information, a lot of data. When do we realize there is a need for design thinking? When everything fails, you come to design thinking. I hope this one line answer helps you. And I'm not exaggerating it. I'm just not exaggerating it. All my design thinking projects in the corporate world the CEOs and the managing directors and the chairmen of the company only come to me when they throw up their hands and say, we don't have a solution anymore and can we now experiment with design thinking. I think one of the biggest challenges we had during the pandemic was we are not able to sell. We don't know what products to bring into the market. Can you please help us? And when everything had failed within the organization, after one year, they came and said, can design thinking work? And did it work? Absolutely it worked. All right. Uh, the stick doctor, Savita, what type of case studies we can give to our students? Well, you know what? In design thinking, we always keep saying this. Every student has his or her own area of interest. Allow the student to delve into the area of their interest and seek the case studies, build the case studies. Don't worry, my showcase will delve into all aspects of it. If there is a student who wants to be an entrepreneur, maybe design thinking as a project can happen there. If there's a student who wants to get into instrumentation, maybe he can pick up a design thinking project on, ins on instrumentation methodologies or techniques or products or whatever. So that's the way it can get into. So allow the students to determine their area of interest because that's how design thinking will work. Design thinking cannot be a standard structured way of giving stuff. Is design thinking different with logical design? 
Well, yes, because design thinking uses abstract as well as logic together. As we spend the time during the week, I will be able to elaborate that for sure. Okay, thank you. It would be so beneficial. Thank you, uh, kind words. I was wondering what analogy to use to escalate the topic to create interest in students when they want to take my first session. <laughs> All right, very interesting question. This is what I tend to do. Tell them the world now needs complex problem solvers and your career and your salary is completely in proportion to the complexity of the problem that you solve. I have noticed a lot of students do get excited. Their first challenge is to get a job. So you tell them design thinking is going to fetch you the job for sure, because design thinking is a coveted 21st century competency, which corporates are going after now. So they got a ready-made talent there. Number two, they can charge a premium for knowing design thinking and having done design thinking. What else would a student want? And can they fast track the career? Absolutely, they can fast track the career. In fact, in every organization where I'm doing design thinking projects and prototypes right now, the talent which is into design thinking gets fast tracked for sure because they're able to handle complex problems. Sometimes when we start explaining design thinking to student, it feels the same as the Indian way of solving problems, Jugad. What is your take on that? Because design thinking is not Jugad. And I don't like Jugad. I don't like Jugard because Jugard is completely unethical. Jugard compromises the economy. Jugard is poor on quality. Jugard is some manipulative shortcuts that people would tend to take. I just do not approve of Jugard at all. Design thinking is a meticulous scientific process of innovation. Please tell your students it's not Jugard at all. And whoever came with this definition of Jugard for design thinking, I don't know what to do. So, sir, uh, Dr. Kiran, please go absolutely head on and tell people VTU and college is not teaching Jugard. You're actually teaching an absolute scientific process. In fact, I loved it last time when your, uh, when the Excellency uh, you know, Vice Chancellor of VTU was actually talking about design thinking and he said, I'm bringing in design thinking into VTU because I want a scientific way of innovation to happen. Hope I've answered that question. Dr. Samuel here, I'm not an engineer, but life skills trainer. Can I be an effective design thinker? Absolutely. Life skill trainers are solving complex life skill issues. And absolutely, you can be a design thinker there for sure. No problem at all. Uh, why is it that people offer design thinking only at the end? Because it is expensive, sir? No, design thinking is not expensive. Design thinking is available for all age groups, not a problem. You have plethora of courses available at different price points. Uh, in fact, I'm sensing today a lot of 21 and 22 year olds are now getting fascinated towards design thinking. In fact, most of the design thinking professionals that I have personally trained are between the age of 25 to 35. I see an aversion in uh, senior folks to really get into design thinking. So I hope that I've answered. I'm not able to see slides. Of, there are no slides of mine. This was just a talk that I went through. I'm not doing any slides. Don't worry on that at all. Why is it that people offer design thinking only at the end? Okay, that is done. I have done that. Offer them only at the end. Is it expensive? I've taken that. Okay, why is it that they all because it's expensive no i think when it also comes to corporate organization they tend to go for design thinking because you know like sir was saying or madam was saying design thinking is also seen to be a jugad by corporate organizations but when they research and they find out that apple is doing it coke is doing it they realize it's not jugad it's big time companies which are indulging into design thinking i hope i have answered all the questions thank you very much it's 11 29 it's time to say goodbye i'm going to see you shortly as we move through the process and uh, uh, you can follow me for all the showcases i am putting my my linkedin id here and if you love information please do join me on linkedin and please do join the showcase design thinking for niket karasgi and remember next five days that I'm devoting with you 
are for the nation. I'm talking to nation builders and I'm talking to people who are going to create amazing maverick engineers so that India as a country prospers. Thank you very much. We will engage with this thought of creating a great set of students and contributing to the economy. Thank you. It's 1130. Uh, I close my session. I shall be seeing you in the subsequent days. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. If you have any...